Self technology, the internet, GPS in the palm of your hand, autonomous operation. Technology is a driver of our times. Since its founding in 1958 in the midst of the Cold War, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has been a driver of technology. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's core of program managers, their job to redefine what is possible. My name is Ivan Amato and I'm your DARPA host. Today I'm excited to have with me for a bit of an encore appearance, Dr. Ann Fisher, a program manager since 2017 in the agency's Defense Sciences Office. I talked with Ann back in 2018 in a previous Voices from DARPA podcast. Ann and I are recording our conversation from our respective homes as we do our part to slow the spread of COVID-19, the pandemic disease caused by the new coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. My heart goes out to all of those in the U.S. and around the world who are enduring all kinds of grievous losses, stresses, and anxieties due to the pandemic. Please note that because we are recording outside of the studio setting and on a particular windy day, you might hear wind noises, birds, and other ambient sounds. Anne Fisher is a chemist by training with professional experiences that have taken her to the Naval Research Laboratory, the Navy's corporate laboratory, which is just a few years away from its centennial celebration. And she's also been at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, where she was a science and policy fellow. Prior to becoming a DARPA program manager in the Defense Sciences Office, she had been a senior advisor for DSO while at the consulting firm Strategic Analysis. And thanks for joining me for the podcast for a second time. It's good to be here, Ivan. Thank you. In this podcast, I want to focus on the part of your portfolio that you have been able to swerve into our scientific and technological responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. These programs include your Accelerated Molecular Discovery Program and the Make It Program, and that one stands a chance of circumventing supply chain vulnerabilities by enabling low-cost fabrication of many important molecules and chemical ingredients sort of anywhere, anytime, and affordably. So I look forward to learning more about where you, you have been taking that program. But let's start with AMD, the Accelerated Molecular Discovery Program. What is the goal of it? What is its status? And how is it relevant to our pandemic response? Sure, Ivan, thank you. Um, so Accelerated Molecular Discovery, or AMD, is, is really a program about helping chemists identify and discover new molecules that meet the property demands that we have. So we come, we come to the table with challenges. These challenges could be um, that I need a new material in the field uh, for some protection measure. These challenges could be that there is a new disease on, on, on the horizon and we need to develop a, a therapeutic for that disease. And really, instead of using our intuition and our, and our hands in the experiment, what AMD is really trying to do is help leverage computational resources, including machine learning, leverage automation, to really help us accelerate the rate at which we can identify new molecules within the vast space of, of potential molecules that might meet our capability needs. Okay, and this is in contrast to the traditional sort of bench chemistry way of discovering materials where there's a lot of trial and error, there's a lot of uh, synthesis innovation that has to happen, and here you're trying to leverage automation tools, computation, and so forth, right? Um, you've had some experience, I think, on, on the bench, did you? Yeah, I did, I did, and, and I think this is, this is traditionally the way we do things, and we still do them today in the laboratory by hand, and that's not a bad thing, it just, it, it doesn't, um, the, the, the time scale at which it takes to do those experiments and then the limitations of, of a chemist who, who has a training in a particular space of molecules or synthetic capabilities really sort of hinder innovation and being able to look outside of that sort of space in which we work, which when you consider the vast possibility space of, let's say, something like 10 to the 60th potential molecules that might provide us the capabilities that, that we're looking for, Really, these tools are, are to help a chemist, automation in the laboratory to make experiments faster, and machine learning and, and other models to be able to actually understand properties in a really vast array of molecular space so that we can be more efficient and effective in finding things like cures to, to uh, COVID-19, uh, whether they be antibiotics or, or antivirals to, to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Wow. I mean, when you said 10 to the 60 molecules, so that's, if I'm not mistaken, that's a trillion, 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 trillion molecules. And what you're trying to identify in that vast search space are a particular molecules suited for particular purposes. So, um, and as you said, that can be for materials, it can be for pharmaceuticals, it can be uh, for other molecules of interest to the Department of Defense and to military needs. 
Let's actually do, so zero in on, on how you're thinking about applying this or how you already are beginning to uh, with the uh, performers who you have under contract for the program. Uh, how are you swerving that into the uh, COVID-19 response? So that's a that's a really great question, and and what we're trying to do is actually leverage what capabilities we've developed thus far in the program in the context of COVID nineteen, and you know AMD is actually a relatively young program. Uh, we just got kicked off at the very end of last year, and so from an experimental perspective, we're building up the capabilities to do the experiments with that would then validate predictions. But really where we're focused on for COVID-19 right now is on the computational side. Um, that's both because that's where we're most mature, but it's also because all the laboratories are shut down. So when we think about being able to kind of build these capabilities, what can we leverage today when people are home and want to help in the fight? And so one great example of what we're doing in that space is some effort at MIT right now, which is a, one of the performers on the program. They did some early work in the program on developing antibiotics. So there was actually a paper recently in Cell. Uh, they were on the cover of Cell in February. And they essentially reported that they searched virtually through over 100 million molecules. So again, something no chemist could do in any relevant time frame. searched for molecules that are known to us that might have antibiotic activity. And, and what they were able to define is, is essentially to map these molecules to properties that are relevant for antibiotic activity. They then even tested these molecules against cult cell cultures and uh, bacterial cultures, excuse me, and were able to, to show molecules that were actually of, of interest for other things like, like diabetes therapeutics that actually had uh, antibiotic activity against bugs that were relatively resistant to, to antibiotics. So this was, this was actually a really critical finding, and it was pre- all of the, the activity now surrounding SARN and COVID-19. And, you know, it's actually interesting to point out this demonstration of antibiotic activity, there are a lot of folks focused on now finding an antiviral. So, so we want to be able to develop an antiviral for the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but of many of the people that are in, in the hospital, bacterial infections, these are so-called secondary effects of infection of COVID-19. Bacterial infections are, are a significant challenge, particularly those that are resistant to, to current antibiotics that we have. So MIT is actually now looking for antibiotics for COVID-19 using the same tools and then building and augmenting the tools that they developed for this paper that was highlighted in Cell. So if they were able to uh, kind of achieve this result to say identify you know from the vast search space chemical structures that would be able to potentially have antibiotic function against uh, secondary infection, like a pneumonia infection, what would actually, what would MIT actually deliver and then what would be the next step? Yes, yeah, so they are actually, we, we, we have uh, built a collaboration between MIT and Walter Reed Army Institute for Research, so known as RARE, W-R-A-I-R. And essentially what they're going to be delivering is here are some candidate molecules that could potentially serve as antibiotics. Those molecules, uh, you know, sort of what we want to do is then rank order them. What of these molecules are already FDA approved? So they might be FDA approved for a completely different purpose, but we now have shown computationally that they might have antibacterial activity. Then there are molecules that can be commercially purchased. They might not be FDA approved, but they're out there on the market. And then there are molecules that are completely new and novel. So what we then do is send that list to Rare, and we've already got some hits, and, and, and Rare is taking a look at those hits now and saying, okay, how can we then build those into our assays and do the experimental validation? I'm sorry, and then ultimately that would go forward potentially into animal tests and to uh, clinical trials with people. That's right. That's right. And we're, we're leveraging all of the resources that we have in the Department of Defense in terms of those um, assay and, and animal testing capabilities so that we're ready to go when we do identify a, a viable hit. And also because these secondary infections and conditions like pneumonia are, not, are common, uh, this could have lasting effect even beyond the present uh, um, dilemma. That's right. And I think, again, important to emphasize is the development of antibiotics that are effective against bacteria that are typically resistant to known antibiotics that we have. I think uh, listeners will, will, will know they've heard things like antibiotic resistance before and overuse of antibiotics, those types of things. So we really have to continue to, to, to innovate um, and, and, and develop new medicines so that we can address uh, these new bugs as they emerge.
And thank you for uh, giving us a, an update on the Accelerated Molecular Discovery Program, and congratulations for getting that launched right at the end of last year, which is, of course, exactly when the COVID-19 outbreak began before it sort of grew into this global conflagration of a pandemic. But another program is relevant here, perhaps in the near term uh, as well as the long term. It's called the Make It Program. We spoke about this back in our earlier podcast, but I'd like you to tell listeners briefly what the Make It Program is attempting to do and, again, how it potentially could become relevant in situations like we find ourselves in now. And while AMD is, is all about discovery, is all about, you know, what molecule do I need to address whatever technological challenge I'm facing, Make It is about how do I produce that molecule. So it doesn't matter how many molecules we identify that we might need as a, an antiviral or an antibacterial. What really matters uh, in addition to that is how do I make that molecule? How do I synthesize it? And make it is about developing new capabilities so, so that we can essentially have devices which not only can help and aid us in the synthesis of, of a molecule, which is currently done by hand, but also that, that can make many, many molecules on a single platform. So I'll give you an example. If you think of an oil refinery where everything is in piping and tubing and we go from what I'm starting with on the front end of that and then I'm processing it to some final product, that's effectively what, what make it device do and they allow you to do that fully automated so that you can take raw starting materials and produce many different products. So as an example, over the course of, of the last several years in Make It, we've demonstrated the synthesis of over 35 different drugs from, again, things that you can buy or purchase from a chemical company all the way to that final product. What I'm imagining here then, are, are, maybe you can paint the picture better than me, but these would be facilities that are not so big, but that would potentially enable anybody sort of anywhere, anytime to make almost any synthesizable chemical, uh, you know, kind of wherever they are and as needed. But why don't you describe uh, how this, for example, could play out in a public health situation where a particular kind of, say, pharmaceutical was needed, but was hard to get? Yeah, so Ivan, your description is actually really, really good. And, and I think it sort of lends itself now to me talking about what the original vision for something like Make It was that instead of having sort of centralized facilities that are producing large amounts of chemicals, large amounts of, of medicines, we could actually deal with challenges that, that are faced, whether they're because of we're in wartime or because we have a supply chain problem or because there's a pandemic and now there's a need for certain medicines. We can essentially take these devices, which are incredibly flexible, and on a single device, then sort of tune them to, to address the need at hand. So you can imagine them doing that at a single location, but not only that, because they're essentially the size of maybe your dining room table. You can imagine that they could then have this sort of a distributed network of these devices so that we could be now making things at the point of need. And that was really always the vision of the Make It program. And that's, I think, really highlights the need to sort of think about, you know, as, as DARPA does, what, what do I need maybe 10 or 20 years down the line? And what are the fundamental research investments that I can make today that can make that a reality? Because now that we have the reality that we're facing today, the investments that we made over the last four or five years in this technology, now we're really poised to potentially kind of scale them and build them out to make a difference in the pandemic that we currently face. Okay, so let me paint a picture about the next pandemic threat. I'm optimistic and I'm thinking about the other side of uh, COVID-19 already. I'm thinking about the next pandemic threat and putting your two programs together. And I'm imagining accelerated molecular discovery, perhaps identifying from that search space of 10 to the 60 molecules an, an antiviral that, uh, that might work. And then I'm thinking about thousands of these make it devices distributed around the world that they might get instructions to to uh, to actually uh, make that antiviral at the point where it can uh, be you know most easily distributed to those who need it I mean is that a realistic picture I think that's absolutely realistic and what we're trying to do right now is is really get our thoughts around what are the major technical challenges that we need to address to make that a reality. Right, so we've invested in the technology, we've got the platforms demonstrated that can make many different materials, but they're research and development platforms. They're not robust, scalable, manufacturable 
devices. And so now we're really starting to think of, as we begin to think about transitioning these capabilities, I have a, a partnership currently with the Department of Health and Human Services Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, which is much easier to say ASPR, <laughs> ASPR, to actually demonstrate some of the capabilities that were developed in Make It and precursor programs at DARPA, again, those fundamental research investments that now have built these capabilities. And we're working with Asper to demonstrate these devices actually for production of an antibiotic, ciprofloxacin, in the context of FDA regulatory processes. So again, now we've got the devices, next hurdle, we need to think about how we deal with the regulatory aspects. We're working closely hand in hand with Asper on that capability. Very exciting news to hear about both the Make It program and the Accelerated Molecular Discovery program. May you succeed wildly in both of those because not only will that serve the mission of furthering the capabilities of our military missions, but it sounds like it would also do a lot of good for a lot of people in general throughout the world. So, you know, do make all of that happen. Now, and as we coast into the end here, I want to switch gears just for a moment. I have a question about the reality of this pandemic for you. As the reality of it became more clear, you know, in February and March, I mean, we, I know, we had been hearing about, obviously, uh, some of it, uh, some of what was happening earlier than that. But I'm just wondering what, what some of your personal thoughts were um, as, as it was becoming clear that this was going to be a, a global public health threat. And then also how it intersected with your professional role as a DARPA program manager. Wow, that's such an interesting question. I think for me, the sort of biggest thing to look back on was how much changed in such a short period of time. So there was about, you know, a three week period where I think we as Americans, at least I, I don't want to speak for everybody in the United States, but we, we saw the pandemic afar. And as it began to impact our, our lives very, very quickly, the realities of all that really sort of came to bear. And I think, you know, even before that happened, we were looking to how we could help in the fight. But it's one thing to kind of see something at a distance and something very, very different when, when it then is impacting every second of your day. And, you know, we're all relatively fortunate that I can work from home. You know, my performers are, are doing things that don't require them to put themselves in danger outside of any sort of quarantine or travel bans, those types of things. So we can do our part right now, and that's what we're trying to leverage those capabilities to do our part right now. But it's it's a struggle. It's, it's challenging. I think everybody who's listening has had some sort of personal struggle or another, whether it's a, a family member who's sick or, or managing kids, which is what I'm doing. You know, managing kids with two working parents is challenging, but it's so critically important that we all work hard on this. So that's what we're trying to do, and that's what I've seen so many colleagues at DARPA do and, and other organizations, which is really, really encouraging. Indeed, indeed. We're, we are all in this together. So thank you for sharing those reflections on what you're doing amidst the reality of a pandemic. So we are about out of time, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity to share or to ask a question that I sh should have asked and didn't. So you can ask that uh, and answer it if there is such a question. I don't really have a question that follows up on anything in terms of comment. It's, it's just it kind of relates to what you just asked about how all this came to be and then what's next. And, and you mentioned earlier the next pandemic. What I hope is that, that we can all learn, you know, sort of very important lessons about the response and how an organization like DARPA is responding and able to put things out and just to really highlight again, the, the importance of, of the fundamental research investments that we've been doing along the way that never were intended to, you know, from at least the make it perspective, address a pandemic. But the way that we can shift that view and focus and still stay true to the main goals of that program, but build a capability much more rapidly than we would have been able to do under sort of quote unquote normal circumstances. Yeah. And just a, a final thought there. I mean, one of the things that I, I, I love seeing at DARPA and the programs that program managers like you and your colleagues do oversee is that so often the capabilities are powerful in general. They're not just going for one specific one-off kind of solution, but they are capabilities that can be applied in many ways. And I think we're seeing that, you know, both with your AMD and, and the Make It program. So uh, nice, nice illustration of that. And I just want to thank you for uh, making time here and for uh, sharing with me and listeners uh, what you're up to. Great. Thank you, Ivan. And thanks, listeners, for sharing this time with us. I hope you join us again for the next Voices from DARPA. Thanks also to Ben Sullivan and Tom Shortridge for their help in producing this podcast. For more information about Dr. Ann Fisher, 
the program she runs in the Defense Sciences Office and the other breakthrough technologies DARPA is working on, visit DARPA.mil. And for links that enable you to download this podcast, go to the Voices from DARPA page on DARPA's website.